Good day, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Before we get to today's patient of the day, this Onkyo TX SR508 receiver, I just wanted to mention I'm starting this around the beginning of June, so that way you know exactly how long it's taking me to get this particular video done. I decided to do this one all in one video, and this is going to be quite a challenging one for me, going outside my comfort zone again. So yeah, very likely I will have to order parts for this one, but we'll see what happens. In this segment, I'm just going to do the diagnostic part of it and uh, see what I need to order, possibly, and maybe see if I can even fix it. And the reason I'm not very comfortable with fixing these things is because I had a bad experience in my early days of electronics repair back when my parents owned the music store and I was specializing in electronic musical instrument repair. Never wanted to do the electronic musical instruments. I wanted to do amps and tuners and VCRs and uh, cassette decks. That's all I wanted to do. And one day in the music store we got a client where uh, their church had been hit by lightning, and uh, the organ was dead, and the PA system was dead. And they brought both of them to me to fix. The organ was easy. All I had to do on that one was change out the uh, main CPU board. It had been absolutely fried by a power surge, and that got that working again. The PA system, or I should say the PA amplifier, was a... Uh, very low-end, very cheap PV unit. I've still got it somewhere in storage, believe it or not. But uh, back then I didn't really know exactly what I was doing around that stuff, so I tried replacing a few parts and never got it fixed, and uh, for some reason it just made me unwilling to even try doing amplifier repair again. So uh, that's what this thing's here for, is to help me get over that. The symptoms of this one are turns on and then turns off, so very likely it's going into protect, protective shutdown, and very likely it's doing that because of either A, bad soldering joints, B, short circuits, or C, blown amplifier outputs. And I'm actually kind of hoping for C because that's the kind of thing I need in order to help me feel more comfortable with doing these kinds of repairs. And you might be asking yourself what I paid for this thing in order to uh, continue my education on the matter. Well, one dollar. That's all this thing cost me. It was on eBay, so I did have to have it shipped here. But uh, yeah, one dollar for the thing and sixty-one dollars to ship the thing from Ontario. So that's what this one cost me. So that's exactly what I'm comfortable with here. Even if I have to order 40 bucks worth of parts, I'm still coming out ahead on this unit because, uh, quite frankly, I would like this thing to uh, take over the audio in the office here because it's got discrete outputs devices on the uh, amplifiers and, uh, yeah, it's probably going to be a much better sounding receiver than the old Pioneer that I've had since 2009. So let's get started on this, shall we? Let's plug it in and see what do. We'll bring it down here. All right, we've got a red standby light. That's good. Let's see if we get a display on power up at least. Yes, we do. And yet, right into shutdown. And the standby light is flashing, so it is going into protection. Yeah, we're going to have to get in there immediately. So I will unplug this unit. And the first thing we're going to do is check the amp channels, but only after I get it apart. Okay, cover is off. And you'll probably see that big Bose Via sitting in the background there. That's another reason I want to get into this now. If I have to order parts for this, then I can order parts for that at the same time. I have already identified the uh, micro switches I'm going to need to replace the top panel buttons on there. And uh, yeah, if I have to order something from DigiKey, it's good to order stuff for multiple devices. 
So I'll bring you to some place I hope you can see. We'll do a little visual inspection first. I don't know if you can see too well. I'm looking at the output transistors for blowed up parts. Not seeing much offhand. There's no obvious blowout markings. I don't see any smoked transistors, but that doesn't mean they're good. I'm looking at the emitter resistors too. So far so good. No signs of any physical damage. Again, doesn't mean much. And uh, it looks like this receiver is good for maybe 50, 60 watts per channel into seven channels. These types of receivers really aren't capable of a lot of power because look at the size of the transformer here. But uh, if this is going into the office, it's fine. It doesn't need to be absolutely heaps and bounds and whatnot of uh, power. So let me set you up here so I can get in there and test. And we will do that. I'm going to get out a red marker here so I can mark which amp channels are the ones that have issues, if we find any issues. So I'm going to go into diode check on my meter here. Okay, and what we're going to do is look for emitter to cathode shorts on every single output device. I'm going to go start from the end here and go all the way that way. Okay, first one. All right, that's encouraging. That one looks good. 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 Not so good. I think we might have found it here. Let me test the uh, other one for that channel again. Okay, so it's either one side or it's only one side of that uh, amp channel that's blowed up here. I'm going to mark that one. So I know where it is. I'm not exactly sure which amp channel that is, but you know, we are finding stuff. Oh, L. Oh, there we go. That one's good. That one's good. 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 And I gotta reach around you to get these last few parts here. Eh, it's gonna be kind of hard to do this without. Uh... In fact, I can't quite do that. You're, you guys are gonna have to just watch the meter here because uh, there's no way for me to do this otherwise. Okay, that one's good. That one is good. And let me get this one way back in the corner here. And that one is good. So we've only got one blown up part in here. And I'm not sure which amp channel that is, once again. But uh, there's the blown up part there, that 2SC5198. And the complementing transistor would be this one down here. So if I do, or not if, 
when I do replace that, both of them are getting replaced. And I may look into upgrading these parts as well. Now we have to test the emitter resistor, this one here. Very likely it's bad. 0.7 ohms, that's not going to be accurate. Usually when these amp channels blow up, they take other stuff with them, so we have to be very careful about that. Let me set that to the to the side here. I think, don't quote me on it, that my uh, ESR meter might be a little better for uh, testing these emitter resistors. So I'm going to try that real quick. Okay, we'll put that there. Point two oh ohms and point two oh ohms. That that's actually good. So just one blown up transistor, one good one, and that's fine. But I'm going to replace that anyway because cheap insurance. And believe it or not, the uh, big Sony receiver that I haven't been able to fix yet actually has compatible parts for these emitter resistors. I could upgrade these right now for, for $0 to uh, 5 watt parts. These are 2 watt. And uh, what I want to do is I want to upgrade the left, center, and right channels of the front speakers to uh, make sure these never blow out again. Because that's exactly how this receiver is going to be used in the future. But we've got more parts to test, so... How about let's do that? It looks like the damage is extremely minimal on this. But uh, having been burned on amp repairs before, I am really not that uh, keen on taking chances. So I'll probably go overboard on this just to make sure I get it right and uh, I build up my confidence a little. And you'll have to forgive me here because uh, I know you can't see the meter. So, down in here, I know you can't see it, there's a thermal management transistor there, and then there's another one in between these two transistors here. I might replace both of those, I might not. They're probably both good. They're awfully hard to see, I'm going to check them. Okay, that one's good. This one I can't really get at, so I can't test that one. If I do replace it, I'll just have to do it blind. Now these are the pre-driver transistors here. I would like to test these. I'll probably replace them anyway. Okay, that one's good. And this one is connected to the uh, thermal management transistor down in here, so probably going to have to get at this from the bottom, but I'm going to try to do it from here with my needle probes. Okay, that one's good. So, there's another resistor here. I would like to check that. I'll probably replace it anyway, like I said. Better safe than sorry. It's reading as 0.8 ohms, so it's a low ohms resistor of some sort. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and just re replace that on general principle. And let's see here, what else do I want to do? 
There are coupling capacitors up here for the audio. I think I will be changing those for audio grade stuff just because I can. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other resistors here I should probably check on. I'm just doing these in circuit, but uh, I have full schematics. I'll just go ahead and uh, replace anything I find suspicious going off the schematics. Sometimes you can't get away with that because of uh, issues, but yeah, sometimes these will be revi revised after the schematics are done, so some things might not match up, but uh, I'm getting a very positive impression of this thing that uh, it needs very little to get back up and running again. And I paid a buck for it. Okay, I'm fairly satisfied. I know what to... Uh, Put in my digikey order for this thing. Now, what I'm kind of wondering is if I want to try and get this so it powers up without shutting down. And the way I could do that is by removing the uh, transistors from the affected channel here, possibly the emitter resistor as well, and then it should stay powered up like that. What I could do is I could damage those transistors and just cut the leads right from the top here. Should I do that? Just had me a little look at the schematics here, and uh, it looks like we are taking out the right channel doing this. So uh, that's the bad amp channel is the right. I paid a buck for this. I don't care if, uh, if I do a whole lot of damage here. Okay, that's done. Now I gotta get the uh, the pins out of the way, or actually, better idea. Let me get the actual output parts out of there. They're dead anyway. They can't stay in there. The uh, blowed up channel has been de blowed up. So I'm going to put these back in because I don't want to lose them. Losing them would be bad, and uh, dropping them inside the amp channels would be bad. You'll have to excuse me, I had two Cokes for breakfast, so I'm extremely jittery right now. Alright, now... How's about you and me see if this thing stays on now? If it blows up further, it only cost me a buck. But it's not going to blow up further, because I got the bad parts out of it. Nothing else tests bad. Okay, plugged in. Let's see what happens. And we have the click of happiness. It is staying on. That's because we got the blowed up channel out. Or the output parts. It's on FM. That seems to be working. I could hook up speakers and test it now, but... Uh, no point doing that until we've actually got it fixed, I don't think. I just want to see what works on it. Do we have a dimmer on this thing? It's kind of dim. There it is. Now that's as bright as it goes. Well, the buttons seem to be working. 
I don't know how to use this thing yet, and I don't have the remote, but uh, very likely I will be getting one. Because I think I can fix this. Yeah, this is clearly staying on now, so we found the only problem with it. Just for giggles, let's test these output parts on the, uh, the cheap Chinese tester here. We'll see what happens. I'm curious. This is not the ideal way to uh, test transistors like this, by the way, but uh, it's what I got, so see what happens. Oh, uh, what the heck? That might be the bad one right there. Yeah, 0.57 ohms and zero ohms. <laughs> But the other one tested good in circuit, so let's try that one. I want to see what this one shows up like. I might have to hold it because it's not really in there very well. Eh, yeah, whatever. Well, folks, that's all I needed. That's the left channel working properly. It's passing audio. No DTS chip errors at all. So that's all I needed to know to get some parts ordered. Let me get to that. Well, folks, I would say that I'm surprised I forgot something important. But uh, yeah, and the reality is I have so little experience with this type of equipment that uh, I'm not surprised. I did forget something important. The important thing I forgot to do is I forgot to check these uh, bias current potentiometers here. Especially the one on the blown out channel. So uh, I've already checked this off camera, but I'll just check it on camera with you today. Or with you right now. So you can see what I get here. These are 2 kilo ohm potentiometers. I'm going between the, uh, the two legs here. This one's measuring at 1.586 kilo ohms. So it's quite off. And I'll just measure between uh, the one leg here and the center. If I can get the meter to make good contact. Which is refusing to do so. Point eight six six kilo ohms. Anyhow, I will show you exactly what the, the neighbor measures. This is the center channel here. If I can get the uh, probes. To make contact. And stop showing me silly results. Okay, yeah, this one's at 1.76 kilo ohms, or 1.77. So this one's a lot healthier. And if I go up to the uh, center on this thing, 0.872 or something like that. So yeah, I've, I've cleaned this. Makes pretty much no difference, but... Uh, the thing is, all of these measure exactly like the uh, center channel one I just measured for you. So uh, I'm not sure I want to keep this in here. It's very possible that uh, I could adjust the bias current properly with this if I left it in. But I think it's so far out right now that I would like to change it. So naturally, I didn't discover this until after I got my DigiKey order in. So... Uh, I've had to order these from eBay. I ordered 20 of them, so uh, that's going to get replaced. Most likely I'm going to pull these uh, pre-drivers out and test them out of circuit or something like that. 
I wanted to order new ones of these just in case, but I could not find any suitable matches anywhere because they're unobtainium. So the idea is I'll measure them out of circuit. If they're bad, what I will just do is I will take the surround back channels and depopulate the entire surround back. And uh, these, these channels will basically do nothing. So this will be a 5.1 channel receiver at, at that point. I'm still going to try to fix this as a 7.1, but uh, just warning you now, it might not be possible. And as far as these parts go, for the uh, right, center, and left channel, I did find uprated parts for those. These are going from 70 watt parts to 100 watt parts. So, uh, And also these emitter resistors, I couldn't find the exact replacements, like these weird noble resistor center tap things. I can't find those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use just a, a pair of power resistors on all, all three of these. And these are going up to 5 watts. So, uh, yeah. By the time I'm done with this thing, it'll blow the power supply before it ever blows one of the main amp channels again. So, yeah, i just got to wait for parts to come in and I can get back to this and hopefully make receiver happy again. Okay, folks. Back after like three months of uh, putting this off, and we are about to hopefully fix the Onkyo receiver today. My one dollar Onkyo. I've got everything, I think. We'll just talk about that real quick. Got a little test jig made up here to uh, set the idle current. I've got the uh, procedure printed out here once we do the part replacement, and I've got a bunch of Brand new parts for this thing up in here. But first, we'll talk about the blowed up parts first. These are dim, and uh, I forget which is which, but one of them had a base to collector short, and the other one had a collector emitter short. So, uh, most likely, what happened with this thing was uh, somebody shorted out the speaker terminals, and the protection circuitry didn't shut down in time. So, uh, I'm actually quite confident I can get this working. We'll see if that turns out to be good or bad. I just came off of uh, fixing that Sony 666ES tape deck and it's physically fixed. It's not adjusted right yet, but we'll get to that as time goes by. But uh, yeah, let's uh, talk about these new parts real quick. These are resistors. These are the new emitter resistors. Basically, I couldn't find the uh, the two-in-one package that they installed at the factory with these things. So, uh, what I'm having to do with this thing is I'm having to use a couple of big 5-watt power resistors, and then what we'll be doing is uh, connecting them back-to-back, -back. kind of like so. And then it'll go down to the board that way. Anyhow, that would be the plan. I got a bunch of them here, because we'll be doing all three main channels, and I toyed with that idea. I almost didn't want to do it. I thought to myself, well, why am I doing the three main channels when only one's failed, and this is kind of a low-end receiver to begin with? Well, I kind of said I would do it, plus uh, once you see how many of these output parts I bought, yeah, might as well go ahead and do it. Anyhow. What else we got here? 100 ohm resistors. These are actually for the test jig that I showed you. This one here, there's two resistors in each lead here, as specified by Onkyo. So we won't probably won't be using these inside the actual unit. They're just for uh, the test setup. We've got some 0 0.22 ohm 1% resistors here. Those we will be using. And let's see what else we got here. This is a fan. This is for my QSC amplifier on the home theater. So that's nothing to do with this. What else? We've got some tactile switches. These are IP67 rated, and these are not for this receiver. These are for the Bose VIA. The virtual imaging array. Basically what I'm doing is I'm replacing the existing button switches in there, which are not sealed. And I'm going in with IP67, so hopefully it'll 
hold up for much longer once I get these switches in it. I actually had some guy arguing with me not too long ago that uh, uh, these types of switches as used in the uh, Bose Via don't oxidize and well, I don't know what to tell you. They definitely oxidize. If they didn't, that the buttons in that thing would work and half of them don't work. And uh, if you wanna know how bad those buttons can get, go back and watch my uh, video on the JVC XUD400 Mark II. The buttons in that one are so badly oxidized and corroded that half of them don't work at all. I had to uh, clean the uh, three eject or three tray eject buttons on that thing in order to even get it to eject the right tray properly. And uh, yeah, if I ever get, get back in there and fix the uh, mini disc part of that, then I'm just going to have to replace all those controls because cleaning the, all those controls, not fun. All right, what else we got here? Well, we've got a bunch of new poten potentiometers. These are for the uh, idle current adjustment. What happens sometimes is when these uh, class AB designs fail, they take out a bunch of other components in the circuit. And I'm hoping that doesn't extend to the transistors in this one because I couldn't find them to replace them. But I did notice that the uh, potentiometer was damaged on that one channel. So I'm going to replace it with one of these. And these are direct from China, so I hope they work. But uh, I didn't want to spend a lot. Okay, next up. 2.2 ohm, 5% quarter watt axial resistors. Probably bought those for a reason. And that reason would be to fix this thing. Okay, and last but not least, we've got the output transistors themselves. What I have here are a lot of them. Let's see if I can get them out here for you. Hopefully this is the job that gets me to uh, overcome my anxiousness about dealing with these amplifiers, but uh, there's one set of transistors. And here's the other set. One set is NPN and the other side is PNP. And since I took them both out of the packaging, I'm going to have trouble telling what's which. And, but uh, that's no big deal, I guess. Anyhow, 10 of these are A1943Ns, and the other 10 are C5200Ns. And these are a substantial upgrade to uh, what's actually in here. Basically, I went with these just to uh, ensure that this thing never pops another transistor again. At least that's the plan. And like I said, all three main channels, left, center, and right, are going in with these parts. Even though the uh, left and center, I believe, are okay in this, I'm just going to go ahead and upgrade because I want to use this in my office to, to power the cambers with. Because I'm hoping this will be better than the Pioneer receiver I've got in there now. Anyhow... We have to get in there and start working on this thing. And I've got a big pile of parts right next to me here that I need to move. So that we can get access to this. Now the plan from here is to disconnect this connector back here. This is for the display. And then what I'll do is I will take out all the screws I can from up top here and we'll take the screws out of the back panel and just move all of this up and out. And there's a bunch of standoffs I'm going to have to release as well. Because of course there are, but uh, yeah, that's the plan anyway. So let's get started, shall we? And I tested this thing again this morning. It does still power up with the, uh, the one channel missing its output parts. So that's good. Now what are the other screws I need to get rid of on here? The other screw for the main heatsink is coming up from underneath, so... Uh, 
we'll get that one from underneath. For now, back panel comes off. Okay, that seems to be loose. Now we'll deal with this uh, ribbon cable assembly here. I'm just going to uh, remove this whole board from the heatsink. I'm not going to try to uh, deal with this plastic cover, I don't think. Okay, yeah, that's freed up. I'll just disconnect the uh, ribbon cable here if I can. Let's just have a quick look at this ribbon cable just to make sure it's not damaged in any way. And we're good. Fantastic. Now there's going to be more screws to take out. And you'll notice that there are a lot of these little plastic spacers here. A lot of them I think I can get to to unclip, but uh, some of them I think I'm going to have to cut off from underneath. Because uh, the right way to get them out is to take all the boards out, out up top, and uh, I would just as soon rather not do that. So, Okay, it's all loose except for those standoffs. You can see one right there next to that hole in the circuit board. I think we're gonna have to get at the uh, the ones over here first. There's a bunch in under here on this bottom circuit board. So what I'm gonna do to get access to those is to uh, dismount the main transformer here so I can move it back. So let me think here. Do I want to disconnect this? I think I do. This type of connector you just push down I think it's been a little bit since I played with one of these and then yeah you push down and then you pull the uh, wire straight up and that's how that disconnects but uh, you gotta watch it with these because they're fragile they'll go in wrong trust me that one's up Trying to get this one on the main board here. And I've decided not to do anything with capacitors on this one also. It doesn't need them. So it's not going to get them. Alright, 75 years later, I think this thing is ready to uh, come up and out so we can uh, do some work on it. I did have to cut a lot of those uh, standoffs, but... Uh, I also was able to save a lot of them too, so uh, should be all right. Now, question is, how can I do this in such a way that uh, I can work on it? Well, for one thing, I gotta get the transformer off the uh, the amp heat sink here. Takes a little finagling, but it'll come. All right, there we go. Now we've got access to the uh, bottom side of this thing. So I'm gonna wanna desolder every part. Let's see, two, four, Six, yeah, every part from here back to there because we're replacing all of those. And like I said, I will uh, take out the transistors on the one blown out channel just to test them with or just to test them just to make sure they still work. Okay, so I got the pre driver transistors pulled and I've got also the uh, emitter resistor pack pulled, sometimes called a noble resistor. We're going to check all three of these. So 
first the transistors because I want to know if they're okay. Do this one first. Looks all right to me. Hard to see with these stadium lights on that I've gotten in here, but uh, whatever. Let's try the next one. And that looks good to me. So we'll be reinstalling those. And you have to be careful because this one's got a little bit of thermal compound on it. This is to uh, thermally connect it to, uh, let's see if I can show you this transistor right here. That's for thermal management and I'll be cleaning that off and reapplying new thermal grease and probably getting the uh, transistor to live a little bit closer to uh, its little buddy here. It's supposed to be regulating. But uh, yeah, this resistor I gotta replace yet. Haven't done that. Gotta remember to do that. And then as you can see I've got all six of the uh, main transistors out for the main channels. So. Uh, the ones that are still good are in these baggies here, and they will be kept for a future project, maybe. But uh, let's see if the uh, emitter resistors are good. I'm betting they are not. They tested out of spec when I uh, last did this. And this is the only one of these resistor packs I'm going to replace, actually. The other two for the main channels are fine, so I'm not going to replace them. So the ESR meter is the most most blah, 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 most accurate for this kind of thing. 0.21 and 0.21. Ah, that actually might be in spec, but uh, 0.21 we might be able to reuse these actually, or reuse this actually. Just for giggles, I want to at least pull out. Some of the 0.22s I actually bought, the five waters that I intended to replace these with. And I'll probably be doing this anyway on this channel, but uh, it's just the other channels don't need this done. Okay, where's my ESR meter again? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm finding a staggering amount of bad solder joints on the board underneath this thing so uh okay 0.21 same deal so i'm going to gamble i'm going to say this emitter resistor is good and i'm going to throw it back in there we don't actually need to replace these today If they're measuring the same as the new ones, what's the point? Oh, that might not actually be actual thermal compound on that little transistor back in there. It is, it's just hard, I guess. But I will thermally couple that back to its uh, little buddy here. Check this out. That's not me, that's Onkyo Factory. Terrific. Okay, so it's time to pick transistors. I got everything replaced on the board I'm planning to. I did get one of the new pots installed, but believe it or not, the old one was fine when measured out of circuit, because of course it was. And yeah, that's the general way this has been going. Everything I'm testing has been fine, except for the blown up parts. So, uh, I hope this works when we're done because uh, I did try to make a new emitter resistor, but uh, I can't get it to fit. So uh, yeah, 5 watt parts, not so good for replacing 2 watt parts on this particular receiver. So what I'm going to do now, so I'm going to test each one of these 4 transistors, or 8 transistors, and I'm going to try to find a pair for each channel that relatively match each other. And I've got a pair, one extra pair here just in case. Now, my little tester here is not the right tool for the job. I'll tell you that right now. However, since I do not have the lab of Mendit Mark, 
I don't have much options here. So uh, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to look for beta gain on all four, on all eight of these to see which pair matches up best. So let's get started with that now. Try this one first. HFE 112. You may notice I'm wearing my anti-static strap. That's just a precaution. 87 on that one. Yeah, Mendit Mark has much better tools for this kind of thing. Much better test equipment. Okay, 97, 97, 87, 95. So that one's not getting used and doesn't really matter which ones we use from the top because they're all relatively consistent here. So, and those are the only ones I'm testing. The other ones in the uh, things here, I'm not too worried about. Okay, I'll take one of the 115s out because uh, A little bit too far apart from the uh, 90 something ones. Okay, there's our three pairs right there. So now I gotta figure out which ones are the best to go with which. The 95 and the 112, we'll stick those together. And then, yeah, the other two, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna leave them just like this, and I'm gonna go install them now. And then, yeah, once I'm done with this, I'm going to have to go through and uh, really get on these solder joints. Because there are a lot of bad ones I'm seeing. Okay, now the first transistor to install is an NPN, which is the 2SC5200N. I'm going to put some heat sink compound on the back of the transistor. And the insulator's already in there, don't worry about it. And I've already cleaned everything off. Should be good to go. There we go, I got some thermal compound on this, not too much. A little goes a long way with these. Okay, that's one, and we gotta put the screw in, of course. Thank goodness I found my stubby screwdriver. Very nice when it comes to this kind of thing. And we need the complement for that, which is the uh, A1943N. The thermal compound will squeeze out, so... If there's too much, it'll just come out the side and you'll just be wasting some. All right, we just want to snug them up. We don't want to Hercules them down and break something. There are lock washers on these screws, so uh, don't worry about them loosening up. All right, folks, should be all over but the soldering now. And the uh, idle current adjustment, of course. Just gonna fold the leads down so can solder them now. And we're gonna have to watch it because there was one here that was almost shorting out on another trace. So uh, yeah, watch for that when you're doing this kind of work too. This is really gonna go through the solder, I'm sure. But I've got lots, I've got another new roll. All right, so that one's done. think it's done. So I will go off camera now and I will finish up the rest of these and uh, yeah you can see there's a bit of a heat damaged part of the circuit board over here. This is another thing you got to watch for with these receivers. If you find any heat damage like that go through it carefully make sure all the solder joints are good. 
I've already done this section, but uh, I might go over it again before I put this back together. And one thing I should mention is some of these standoffs that we actually cut to uh, get in here did not need to be cut. A lot of them are just like this, they're flat tops. So really the only ones you have to uh, worry about are the ones further towards the middle of the unit. Those are the ones that are that have clips on them. So uh, yeah, I wish I knew that before, but I know it now, but whatever. All right, folks, I think it's ready to go. I resoldered maybe 50 bad joints. I'm not real thrilled with Onkyo's build quality right now, I'll tell you that, but I think we're ready to do the initial idle curtain adjustment. What they want you to do is do one adjustment after straight after power up with 2.5 millivolts on each of the left, center, and right, and then wait four to six minutes and do another adjustment as specified here. But uh, we're only doing this on the three main channels, the three parts, or the uh, three ones that I replaced parts on, at least for the initial adjustment. We'll do the uh, heat soak adjustment on all seven of them, probably, but uh, yeah, the, the initial ones, just the main channels, and I'm going to start with the one that had the blown out parts, because I am real nervous, and you can't see it. Well, now you can. I've got my IR camera powered up and ready to go just in case something fails, which is a distinct possibility. Never successfully repair an amplifier before, so. Okay, we are set to go. Power is applied. And I hope you can see that because it needs to be where I can see it best. Okay, so. Screwdriver on adjustment, powering on. I'm not getting anything. Why am I not getting anything? I'm looking at the IR camera right now. New transistors are warm, but they're not scorching hot. Getting like 26 degrees. I know you can't see them, but uh, maybe now you can. So why am I not getting a reading? Do, are my leads not connected? All right, we'll try her again. I don't know if it was in protective shutdown or not. Let me go around to the front and I'll see what it's doing. It's clicking in. It should be working. And yet I'm not getting an, an adjustment or a value there. Why am I not getting an, a value there? Okay, there's still a problem with this, I think. Because we should be getting something there. And I don't know what to look for because I'm just not experienced enough with amplifiers. And it could be the soldering joints brought this whole thing down. So let me do this other channel here. And maybe I'll try and figure out what's going on. I just don't get it. It's not going into protection, so why am I not getting a reading here? Well, folks, I think I might have found it. I found a smoked resistor. This is R6021, I do believe. Let me show you what it measures. If I can get my uh, probe on it. 111 kilo ohms. You know what it's supposed to be? 2.2 ohms. 
I bet you that's the problem. Oh, by the way, I found another 12 bad soldering joints. Literally, at least 12. So the damaged resistor is this one right here, right there. And uh, as you can see, it goes right to one of the pre-drivers. The other one is down here. Now I'm thinking maybe I should check C5051 also at 47 microfarad at 50 volt capacitor because now would be the time to replace it while I've got everything apart. And I'm kind of concerned about Q6011 and uh, Q6001 yet. So maybe I'll check those two and uh, yeah. Could definitely explain why this whole amplifier section wasn't working. If that wasn't working and way up there at 111 kilo ohms, of course it wouldn't work. So let me go back to the receiver and we'll see what we can find out. Well folks, the story ends right here, at least for now. See this here transistor? Shorted, dead shorted across all pins. I'll show you what it does. See if I can show you here. This is Q611 right there. It's responsible for regulating the, uh, or for, uh, how can I explain this? It's responsible for adjusting the circuit based on temperature and it's fried. So the failed resistor is all the way up here, right there. So yeah. I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start looking for A, the pre-drivers. I'm going to replace them now. I have to find suitable replacements. Don't know if I can or not, because I couldn't find them the last time I looked. But uh, yeah, I think I want to replace this one as well, Q6001. That one tests good, but uh, I'll show you here if the camera gimbal will cooperate. That transistor is, come on, gimbal. It is this one right down in here. So yeah, it's the counterpart to the uh, one that's failed. So I don't know. Like I said, I am not very good with amplifiers. So uh, one of y'all will have to tell me what I should look at now that I know that this one's failed. I have preemptively changed C5051, this 40, 47 microfarad at 50 volt capacitor. It was audio grade, it's now another audio grade, it's Nichicon UKA, but uh, that was good. I have not checked these resistors yet, I might do that, but uh, yeah. You can see right here, if I can get you in. See if I can show you a little better here. You see this transistor connects directly to the uh, to the uh, potentiometer I replaced, which apparently is still good. But uh, I'm kind of glad that I went and replaced it anyway. Now that I know that Q6011 has failed. But yeah, I want to check R6051, 6011, 6001, and 6031, or better yet, just replace all of them. But I don't think there's any other problems further back in the circuit. I think it's all Q6011. And uh, thanks to this one resistor being open, we didn't smoke any of our new parts. So uh, yeah, I got off kind of lucky with that one. So yeah, I got to find me a new one of these for sure, because I do want to repair the amplifier. I don't want to just uh, pull this part out of one of the other channels to get it working. But uh, yeah, that's where we're at. So you guys let me know what you think about this uh, receiver. Should I keep going? Do you agree with me that uh, our, that Q6011 is likely the only problem left? Because I've checked everything else in the circuit beyond this. Like uh, Q6061 and 6051, those are the two we, re we replaced. 6161 is for protection. That should be working. I believe it is because um, A, it went into protective shutdown when we first started with this thing and B, it's not doing it now. So yeah. 
Anyway, let me guys know... Er... I can't talk again. Let me know, guys, what you think. So, we're going to put this back on the shelf for now, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Take care.